fellow digging into his lunchbox is Larry Johnson. He's getting some experience as an engine repairman. Larry's lucky he's got a good man to show him the ropes. There's the man I mean, Mike Kelly, an old hand at engine overhaul. He's been giving Larry some pointers. Let's see what their lunchtime conversation's all about. Why the big smile, Mike? Why not? The service manager just told me I saved a customer the cost of a ring job and made us look good in the customer's eyes, too. Sounds interesting. How'd you do it? Well, this owner came in about a month ago complaining that he was starting to use oil. And you could tell he was when you looked at the exhaust. Blue smoke, particularly just after you gunned the engine. That's one sure sign of burning oil. You're right, Tech. But just to be safe, I went over this baby with a fine-tooth comb for oil leaks. But everything was tight as a drum. No leaks. Then when I drained the oil, I got my first hint of the trouble. There were some signs of sludge in the old oil. And the filter was really sludged up. So I had a strong hunch about what was wrong. I didn't want to take a chance on guesswork, though, so I continued with the diagnosis. I inspected the oil filter cap and crankcase breather pipe. They sure needed cleaning. That engine crankcase hadn't drawn a deep breath for miles. The owner did a lot of stop and go city driving, short trips where the engine didn't get warmed up. He didn't change his oil and filter as often as he should either. That all adds up to sludge, doesn't it? You bet it does. And I sure found it when I pulled the rocker covers off that engine. The oil drained back holes and both heads were so choked up with sludge that the rocker chambers were being practically flooded with oil. And although the valve stem seals were all okay, a lot of oil was being drawn right past the intake valve stems and into the cylinders. That's what caused the blue smoke. Yes, but were you positive that was your only trouble? No, I wasn't, but uh, I couldn't go much farther without disassembling the engine. I did check one more possible cause, though. A coolant leak into the oil would cause sludge. So I made a pressure test of the cooling system, and it passed with flying colors, no leaks. But if you ever do run into a coolant leak, Larry, remember that the reference book describes some very effective ways to track them down. Thanks, Tech. I'll remember. What about all that sludge, Mike? Well, we decided to flush out the engine. But before I did any flushing, I cleaned out the drain back holes and the sludge from the rocker chambers. Then I installed the rocker covers. Finally, I installed a new oil filter to trap sludge and dirt during the flushing operation. What's the best way to flush an engine, Mike? No secret to that, Larry. It's a two-step process. First, put in two quarts of engine flushing solvent and three quarts of SAE 10 MS engine oil. Run the engine for 30 minutes at 1,200 RPM, and then drain the crankcase. Next, put in two quarts of mineral spirits, or kerosene, with three more quarts of SAE 10 MS engine oil. Run the engine at the same speed for another 10 minutes, and then drain it out. To wrap up the job, I changed the oil filter again, and put in five quarts of MS oil. I also put in a pint of approved crankcase detergent and rust inhibitor to reduce sludge formation. After running the engine, I made sure the dipstick read full. That's important. Because if it's off, the owner might think he's burning oil and add oil before he actually needs it. How about engine temperature, Mike? Glad you thought of that, Tech. On every engine job, always make sure the thermostat's working right. You know, a cold-running engine can sludge up in a hurry. Because of the kind of driving this owner does, we recommended that he change his oil and filter more frequently. We asked him to keep a close check on oil consumption. He stopped in today and said he used less than a quart of oil in nearly 1,100 miles. And that, Larry, my boy, was why I was wearing that big grin. I'm happy. The service manager's happy, and the customer's happy, too. What more could you want? Not a thing, Mike, not a thing. But don't try to tell me they all end like that. There are times when new rings are the only answer. Yeah, I know, and there are a few things I want to tell you about that. Always run a compression test on all cylinders. If any are below specifications, you'll know which ones are giving trouble. Another thing, 
When you do run into ring trouble, never assume that new rings are all an engine needs. Usually, rings don't just go bad by themselves. Something else causes it. And you've got to correct whatever made them go bad in the first place. Right, Tech. And that means more diagnosis while you're disassembling the engine. As you remove each part, Larry, look it over for signs of trouble. For instance, when you pull the head, look for signs of leaks at the mating surfaces of the head and block. Look over the old head gasket, too. On V8 engines, particularly the larger ones, look for signs of an oil leak past the intake manifold gasket. It's possible for oil to leak from the tappet chamber into a cylinder head intake port. If the undersides of the intake valves or their ports are wet with oil, make sure the valve stem seals are in good condition and a tight fit on the valve stems. If the piston heads are wet with oil, Larry, chances are that it's caused by oil getting past the valves, not the rings. That's particularly true on V8s. Tech's right. Now, on the other hand, if the piston heads are coated with carbon, except around the edges where they look like they've been washed clean with oil, it's a good sign that the rings aren't doing their job. I usually measure the bore wear before I pull the pistons, Larry. Then if they're beyond limits for re-ringing, our service manager can let the owner know what the job will cost. Uh, speaking of rings, we'll be adding some new ones on this record if someone doesn't turn it over right now. Well, Larry, we've covered some of the high points of disassembly and inspection. I'd like to just mention a few more before we leave this subject, though. If you find much of a ridge at the top of the cylinder, ream it before you pull the pistons. Otherwise, you might damage the piston lands. Clean the carbon from the top of the cylinder bore before you jump to the conclusion there's a ridge. And don't ever ream too much. That's a good tip. And here's another. Always use cap bolt protectors when you pull the pistons. And keep each cap with its own rod. Never mix them up. They're matched parts. Inspect the rod bearings. Mic the journals. And measure bearing clearance to make sure they're serviceable. If the rod bearings are questionable, better replace them. Rod bearings can contribute to oil consumption, too. And don't forget, Larry, you'll find a lot more of these points covered in the reference book. Okay, Mike. But you haven't said much about the cylinders themselves yet. That's next. But there's some things I want to show you as well as tell you about cylinders. Let's use this slant six block as an example. On every re-ring job, you should always recondition the cylinder walls to provide the best possible seating and oil control surface for the new rings. Although either of these two hones do a satisfactory job, this resizing hone on the left has some advantages. It cuts down on taper and out of round. Of course, you do have to use it carefully or you'll take out too much metal and you'll have to fit and install oversized pistons. I use 220 grit stones. Scrub them in warm water and detergent to get rid of all old oil and loose grit from previous jobs. Turn the crankshaft so that the crank throw and counterweights won't interfere with a hone at the bottom of the cylinder. Otherwise, you could break the stones. Cover everything below the bores with oil-soaked rags to keep out grit. Now douse the cylinder and hone with honing oil. Don't use any fluid other than honing oil, Larry. If you do, the results won't be right. Here's a close-up of the results you should get, Larry. Notice that the hone marks cross at a 60-degree angle. And also notice that the crosshatch pattern covers the entire surface of the walls. Set the hone for a very light cut for your first attempt so we can check the crosshatch pattern and get it right before you remove too much metal. Stop after a few strokes and wipe the bore clean. With this particular drill motor, take about one complete stroke every second. Make them smooth and even and full length of the cylinder. But don't ever let the stones go more than half an inch out of the top or bottom of the cylinder. Gosh, it's no problem at all to get the feel of using this hone. Just up and down, smooth and steady. Looks to me like you've got the strokes timed just about right. That crosshatch pattern is very close to 60 degrees. Always take a light trial cut 
and check the pattern to find out whether you should speed up or slow down on your strokes. But this cylinder still has some low spots, Larry. So clean and oil the stones and squirt some more honing oil on the cylinder walls. Then take a few more strokes. You shouldn't have to take more than a total of 20 strokes. Now remember, Larry, with that resizing hone, never take more than 10 strokes at one time before stopping to see how you've done. Don't remove any more metal than you have to. There's more about honing in the reference book. There, that's fine, Larry. But we're not done with this cylinder bore yet. Now we've got to get rid of every last trace of grit and oil on the walls. First, wipe out the bore with an oil-soaked rag, and then really work it over with warm water, soap, and a soft bristled brush. Scrub until it's spotless. Test the bore by wiping it with a clean white cloth. If the cloth remains clean, the bore's okay. Huh, I thought I'd seen the last of white glove inspections when I got out of the Navy. Now, don't use gasoline, kerosene, or any other mineral solvents. They won't clean the walls properly, and particles of grit will remain in the hone marks. This grit will be picked up by the engine oil and cause wear and damage throughout the engine. When you're sure the walls are perfectly clean, Larry, coat them with oil right away to prevent rust formation. It doesn't take long for rust to start forming on a freshly conditioned cylinder wall that isn't lubricated. Now, be sure and scrub the hone stones with honing oil as soon as you finish with a cylinder. You want to make sure those stones are perfectly clean before you start on the next cylinder. You've sold me on the importance of clean stones, Tech. Now, here's a question I've been waiting to ask. What's the word on using this surfacing hone, Mike? Use 280 grit stones and a high-speed quarter-inch drill motor with this hone. The high speed is important to do a good job on that glaze. You have to take more strokes, though, a total of about 60 in each cylinder. But after each 20 strokes, you've got to stop and apply more honing oil to the cylinder walls. To finish the bore, clean and oil it, Larry. Don't forget to scrub and oil the stones with honing oil after doing each cylinder. And make sure everything below the bores is clean so it's spotless. Okay, Tech, I'll keep that in mind. And now that we've covered cylinder wall reconditioning, maybe Mike will give me a few hints on putting a re-ring job back together. Glad to, Larry. I'll give you the most important one first. Keep it clean. Clean everything before you put it back. Don't ruin a good job by leaving in a sludge or dirt in it to foul it up. To loosen carbon on the pistons, soak them in solvent long enough to give the solvent time to work. Then scrape stubborn spots off. Don't ever use a power wire brush. Use the right size of groove cleaning tool and clean out the oil drain holes after you clean the grooves. If you must scrape carbon from that area, be sure you don't round off the edges of the land. And always remember to follow the instructions that come with this Mopar multipurpose ring set. In Canada, these Crico service ring packages also have complete instructions packed with them. Measure ring end gap in every cylinder, Larry. Use a piston to push the ring into the cylinder. That way you're sure it's square with the wall. Push the ring down to within two inches or less from the bottom of the cylinder, where the diameter is smallest. Measure the gap at this point. Measure the ring fit all around the top groove of every piston. This groove sometimes wears bell-mouthed and won't support the compression ring properly. Now, here are two more important assembly tips. Use the right piston ring installer to make sure you don't damage the rings when you're putting them on the pistons. Use rod protectors when you install the piston so the rod studs won't damage the rod journals. When you install the head, use gasket sealer and be positive the gasket is lined up before you tighten the head bolts. And always use a torque wrench. You can't tell the right torque by feel. Mike has just covered some of the high points of this job, Larry. For the full story, refer to the procedures in your service manuals and the reference book. Okay, Tech, I'll do that. You know, I found out today that engine oil control doesn't depend on piston rings alone but on a lot of other items, too. And if you get the whole story on engine oil control, you'll have the know-how to track down and correct the cause of any oil consumption problem the first time you tackle it. This is important 
because in this business, comebacks are costly. In lost time, in lost money, and sometimes in lost customers. So help your dealership make a good impression by doing the job right the first time.